Britain are some of the finest gardens anywhere in the world. For me, it's about getting in amongst the wonderful plants that flourish in this country and sharing the passion of the people who tend them. However, there is another way to enjoy a garden. And that's the get up above it. I love ballooning because you get to see the world below in a whole new light. From up here you get a real sense of how the garden sits in the landscape, how the terrain and the climate have shaped it. And I want you to share that experience with me. Today we're in North Wales in Snowdonia and from up here it magnifies the grandeur of the landscape. Wherever I look the countryside changes. In one direction Wales coastline, in another forested hillsides and craggy mountains. Snowdonia sprawls across the Welsh county of Gwynedd at the far northwestern reaches of Wales. Snowdonia covers 800 square miles and this region is home to some truly inspirational gardens. And I'm visiting two today. The first is two gardens in one, a formal upper garden and its wild lower dell. And another, once a lookout tower protecting the land approaches to Conway Castle, which has evolved over centuries of garden design. Many reasons to visit a garden, some of them plants, some of them memories. A garden is an aid memoir to life. This is a spectacular landscape with precious gems like these studding its valleys. Snowdonia is an ancient landscape formed nearly 500 million years ago, the result of volcanic eruptions and glacial erosion. Today, it's a dramatic landscape, rocky and damp, not ideal for gardens, but when you fall in love with the place, Snowdonia's little foibles won't stop a determined gardener. So first to Bobnant, a national treasure nestled in a national park. When you're up here in a balloon, you can get a real sense of what Bobland's about. That beautiful house sitting above the garden, those formal terraces bleeding down into that beautiful dell. I have never, ever seen the width of that river. It's magnificent. Those trees just caress the garden and unite the garden with the landscape and I can't wait to get down there. Bodnan covers 80 acres of valley leading down to the River Conway. It's a tricky site for any garden. It slopes west towards the river with the formal gardens laid out on level ground around the house and a cascade of planting which leads to the dell at the bottom. The stream flowing here winds its way out to the river about a mile away. I've been visiting Bodnant since I was a teenager. Now, I remember the first time I came here, I was blown away by the trees, the shrubs, the names, the history. I thought I knew something when I left college. I'd never been to a spectacular valley garden before. And I came here and that illusion was blown away because there was plants I'd never seen, there was names I'd never seen, there was compositions I'd never seen. It was just absolutely amazing. 
Once a grand private estate, the gardens were bequeathed to the National Trust in 1949. One of the gardeners is Fiona Braithwaite. So Fiona, have you always been a gardener? <laughs> no. When I was uh, growing up, I used to mow my dad's lawn and do a bit of weeding, but it wasn't until later on in life that um, I began to eat, sleep and drink gardening, because I'd worked for the Department for Work and Pensions for a number of years, and I decided I needed to change. Uh, at that particular time, Bowden was taking on the first National Trust careership trainee. Wow. And I thought, this is it for me. It was a three-year course. Then I applied for the gardening position here, mm -hmm. and I couldn't believe it. I got it. And I've been here now for nearly seven years. And what's that like? What does it mean to you personally? Oh, it's like the icing on the cake, you know, at Bowden Garden is amazing everything combined together gives it a whole festival of plant color texture for the eyes it runs seamlessly from the terraces which are very formal right the way down to towards the dell which is 120 feet down got the river herethylin running through it beautiful champion trees mm. Fantastic herbaceous trees, shrubs, bulbs, you name it, we have got it. And that's my favourite part of the garden down there. Oh, I'd love it. <laughs> it's the people as well that you work with and the people that you see every day and engage in. It is an amazing garden. And what's more amazing than anything else, in my opinion, is that view of Snowdonia. Shall we go and have a closer look? Yeah, let's. <laughs> Fiona, just look <laughs> at that! <laughs> oh, it's an amazing view, isn't it, Christine? That eternal view is what enticed Henry Pochin to retire here in 1874. The Victorians' love of dramatic landscape was at its peak in the late 19th century when Pochin bought Bodnant, an 80-acre site with a stream running through a deep-sided valley. Pochin had made his money as an industrial chemist, inventing the process that turned soap from brown to a more palatable white. The wealthy amassed allowed him to indulge his passion for plants, which, together with his imagination, were the ingredients needed to transform the original house and the modest garden at Bodnant into a world-class garden wrested from the crags of Snowdonia. After only 10 years at Bodnan, Pochin died leaving the garden to his daughter Laura. Along with her husband, the first Lord Abercomway, she took up the reins. In 1901, they handed the garden that they'd fallen in love with onto their son. The wealth amassed by Pochin and his son-in-law funded the Abercomway's plant collecting habit until the Second World War. So, Fiona, the plant collectors had a big effect on this garden, didn't they? Very much so. The second Lord Abba Conway, who was Henry Duncan McLaren, he invested very heavily into the plant collectors in the early 1900s. Mm. These were people that were going out to far-flung places such as China, America, Australia, and they were bringing plants back from very dangerous areas. And they, they would risk their lives to collect seed and plants. They had to be there at the right time. And then, of course, they had to bring them back mm. by ship. And, of course, you know about the Wardian case, yes. Nathaniel Ward. He was the one who invented that. And so they were able to bring more plants back still alive. Nathaniel Ward's invention revolutionised plant collecting. The Wardian case is a glass contraption like a mini greenhouse. It protected living specimens dug up in remote locations and allowed them to be easily transported home. It was a gift for the late Victorian plant hunters sponsored by the Armour Conways. Men like Frank Kingdom Ward and George Forrest were able to travel the world, returning to Bodnant with their prized specimens. Kingdom Ward headed to the Far East, returning from Tibet with the first viable seed from the Mechanopsis, the Himalayan blue poppy, that still grows freely at Bodnant. 
George Forrest travelled to China and concentrated his efforts in Yunnan province, amassing a huge collection of rhododendrons, which he sent back to his benefactor in Wales. Now one of the country's national collections of rhododendrons flourishes at Bodnant. But as many as 600 different species at times came back to Bodmin, didn't they? Yes. Through these collectors. Well, the uh, head gardeners, which includes uh, the three generations from the Puddle family, mm -hmm. Frederick, Charles and Martin, in one of their diaries, they actually said they were excited about opening these cardboard boxes <laughs> and uh, packaging and crates of plants that had never been seen before in this country and they didn't know how these plants would survive. What we feel in this garden is phenomenal love. Yes. Mutual respect of the owner and the gardener, yes. the plant collector, the vision coming together to make a very, very spectacular collection of plants in such a beautiful setting. As Henry Duncan McLaren used to say, design means everything. And then once you've got the design, you can actually put in the plants later. Have the skeleton and then put the muscles. Where else could you get this? And where else would you want to go? Of all the plants those intrepid explorers brought back, I love Bodnant's Primula collection. There are 25 foreign species in the collection here, gathered in Asia all those years ago. Flowering in Bodnant's famous collection is the Candelabra Primula from Sichuan. Its cerise flowers create swathes of colour in the wilder areas of the Dell and the shrub borders. It's a welcome splash of colour in the late spring. It loves semi-shade and rich, moist conditions, and it doesn't mind if the soil tends towards acidic. Amongst Bodnant's exotics are examples of Britain's five native primulas. You'll find good old common primrose and cowslips growing freely in the less formal areas of the garden. Every time I turn a corner in this garden, there's another surprise. Now, this area of the garden has a very different feel to it, doesn't it? So yes. how was it created? Well, this area where we're standing now, we're actually in front of the Poem Mausoleum, which was uh, built by Henry Davis Poaching, and it's the final resting place of the family. But what makes it also my favourite area is that when I was training as a, a, a starter off gardener, I was given this huge project to actually renovate this area. Tackling an unloved patch of garden so early in her training has stood Fiona in good stead. Getting your hands dirty and starting from scratch is the only way to learn how to plant and where to plant. There's always stories behind a particular tree or a particular shrub, where it's come from, where it's going, how it's been planted, whether the colour, the texture's right for that area, the conditions of the soil. You know, here at Bodnum, we have stiff boulder clay overlying friable, shady rock. It's acidic. But when you look around you, you think, how on earth can we produce a garden as beautiful as this over the rock that's only about two or three inches in some areas below the surface. And you see right plant, right place, <laughs> yes. and it works. Yeah, it's but got people to. spend years yes. looking about with that. Yeah. You know, putting the wrong plant in and it drops dead and then they say flipping plant. <laughs> they don't say flipping gardener. Yes. There are exceptions to that rule, but on the whole, gardeners lose plants every season while they work out what grows best where but there's an easy shortcut to avoid a bin full of dead plants. They should go to gardeners, ask them questions, saying, what condition have you got here? You know, what condition do your hellebores like? Do they like damp or dry conditions? And what type of soil? And as gardeners, we love talking. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. <laughs> shall we do some of these um, yeah, hellebores? And um, we're just going to deadhead these hellebores. They've got hellebore leaf spot. Yeah. So what do you normally do with this stuff when you've cut it off? We'd have to burn that. You couldn't compost it, otherwise the spores would invade into the compost and you'd get it everywhere. 
so you've got to burn it. And it removes anything that's diseased? Yes. Now, you see, I've got a little fancy trick with hellebores. You know that how they seed down really easy on the soil? Yeah. That's not a problem because you just dig them up, pot them up and then grow them on. You take the seed away or you get dry seed, yeah. that could be a nightmare to germinate. Right. If you sow it just into pure horticultural sand yeah. and keep that really damp, germs like mustard and cress. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Further down the valley is Bodnant's Damp Dell, the highlight of this garden for me. I work in the Dell as a, with the team. I think it's got the wow factor. You've got the huge champion trees that people don't realise how actually large these trees are. Some species tower up 100 feet above the Dell. Fiona does sometimes have to go home, but gardens like this attract their own fan club. And here there's a large team of gardeners and locals who help out. We have about 30, 35 garden volunteers that come in about one day a week. Yeah. We also have the meeters and greeters, yeah. uh, the people that say hello and direct the cars and the car park. Again, we couldn't do without them. I think we work all together as yeah. a, a one big family. And is there that sense of camaraderie right from the top all the way down? Oh, it's got to be, especially in Bodnick Garden. That's what makes it so special. And just look around yeah. you. You know, working in this area, working in Bodnick Garden, who could want for more, really? It is a very special place. Someone who can't resist the allure of Bodnant is green-fingered volunteer Phyllis Davies, who has a family connection with the garden that goes back generations. Phyllis's father and grandfather were originally Welshmen. Her family moved to London for work, but she returned every summer as a child to Bodnant. To me, this was sort of paradise, if you like, because it was all green and we had grass and you had trees and we didn't get too many of them in the East End of London, especially after the war. It was a different world, a different world and a world I actually wanted to be part of. With Wales running through her veins, at the age of 20, she left London and returned to her family homeland, living close to Bodnant, where her grandfather had been one of the estate's first volunteers. It was a local retired policeman, naturally at home, asking people to keep off the grass and giving them directions. I don't think that he would actually have um, been as chatty to people as we are. Um, and maybe they weren't to him, I, I don't know. He did have a great regard for Bodnant, and I think he'd be quite chuffed actually to find that, you know, there was a number of his family that was keeping the tradition going. I hope so, anyway. Once the family had grown up and she retired, Phyllis decided to continue the family tradition volunteering here. What do you actually like about the job? Meeting people. Um, and you get their different views on, you know, what they like. And yeah. you say to you, have a lovely... Oh, yes, we've had a wonderful time. And how many years have you been coming? You know, cos I've seen you over a few years. Oh, this is my sixth year. Sixth year? Yeah. Wow, yes. that must be great fun. Yes, it is great fun. The 180,000 tourists who visit every year and the volunteers who work at Bodnant all take away a personal memory. So what does this garden actually mean to you? It means a lot to me because my grandfather came here and doing what I'm doing now many, many years ago. Um, so I've grown up coming to the garden. And although I wasn't born here, I always said that when I was old enough, I would come and live here. And that's exactly what I've done. You gain a new understanding of a garden when you work in it and chat to the visitors. Phyllis has some lovely tales to tell. We had one lady who came who was in a wheelchair. She was a very elderly lady. And we asked her how she had a lovely time. She said, oh, yes. And she said, when I die, which won't be long because I'm 95, she said, I hope that heaven 
will be like this, because she said to me, this is heaven on earth. If that's what a garden can do to you, it can touch mm. your soul. The other Conways left us a wonderful garden to enjoy, but I often think us ordinary folks should leave our mark too. Everyone who's worked hard in a garden like this deserves a little recognition. What I really like about this terrace is the rhythm that's created with these obelisks. They draw you along and it's one of your favourite areas, isn't it? Yes, I love the trellises and I love the urns on the tops. The rose terraces were carved out of the valley side in 1905. They take giant steps down the steeple with the climbing roses supported on wooden trellises. They've been repaired in recent years, but restoring the urns on top has been too costly. The Lord Abba Conway used to reside in London and he used to go to the Ritz Hotel for his tea or his dinner and he saw the urns positioned right along the roof line and he actually brought the design back to Bodmin in, the, in these gardens. Who nicked the idea? Well, let's just say he borrowed, borrowed the idea. A new urn with a heavily inscription engraved on it could be the perfect tribute to the team at Bodnant, something that celebrates all the gardeners and volunteers here. Getting people to enjoy gardens and the landscape is one of my missions in life. And what a landscape Snowdonia is. It attracts four and a quarter million visitors every year. And at its heart lies Wales' highest mountain, Snowdon, a whopping 3,560 feet. It's a site of special scientific interest, home to unique plants and protected species, as well as to the famous Snowdon Mountain Railway, managed by Alan Kendall. Snowdon has always been a magnet for intrepid visitors. So prior to a railway, about a thousand people a day in 1850 walked up it or traveled by donkey or mule or horse. So it's always been a, a mecca for people out to enjoy the outdoors. When the railway was opened in 1896, um, they also opened a very nice hotel. And well to do people could come and put Snowden on their, their 1896 bucket list. Queen Victoria's love affair with Britain's highland wildernesses had removed the fear factor from the country's crags. And with a railway running all the way up to the summit, the well-heeled Victorian, as well as the day tripper, could now enjoy the views from Wales' top mountain. But in 1890, the railway may never have been started if the slate industry had not gone into decline, forcing the local landowner, Ashton Smith, to diversify. He reckoned that if a thousand people a day were prepared to walk up it, then perhaps even more might pay to ride to the summit. December 1894, they cut the first sod on the railway. Official, you know, had an official ceremony. Um, and construction started straight away with a completion date scheduled for July 1895. It was clear that they weren't going to achieve that because of the amount of time it took to build the viaducts. And by January 1896, the thing was complete, and the first train was Easter. It could have all ended there, on the inaugural journey, disaster struck one engine, which ran out of control on descent. One passenger died. Thankfully, that was the last rail accident on the mountain. And nowadays, 350,000 tourists safely reach Snowdon Summit on foot and by train every year. Since the Victorians' first attempts, only small areas of Snowdonia have been tamed. But those that are are spectacular. Much older than the railway, or even Bodnant, is Body Gathlin, another stunning valley garden. It was originally built 800 years ago as a lookout tower for Conway Castle across the Conway estuary. But it's now a house and a very spectacular garden, covering 200 acres. The gardens here flourished despite the terrain. Harsh rocks and tricky soil never stopped a Victorian gardener intent on making a fabulous display. 
Well, the Adathlon is really exciting from the ground, but from up here, you can see the definition of that part there, far clearer than you can see when you're down there in Intimate. It's a garden that excites both from down there and from up here. It's a wonderful historic estate, now a smart hotel, but it's really all in the grounds that I've come here for. I'm dead envious of the head gardener, Robert Owen. What a cracking job he's got. Robert, how long have you been associated with this garden? Uh, this is my 34th year. So you came as a young man? Yeah, a little tiny boy. Has it changed over the years? Uh, I believe it's better now than it was 30 years ago. Mm. Yeah. It's better than when I first saw it, and I first saw it in about 1979, 1980. So you're doing a cracking job. Thank you. Historically, what was the role of the head gardener in that period? Well, 150 years ago, the head gardener would have been responsible for putting unusual, early, late fruits and vegetables on the table for the honorary guest. Today, um, my duties are to please the guest of the house and make sure that this parterre and other parts of the garden are up to the standard uh, which are expected. In, in a house of this quality. So, in many ways, exactly the same roles. Yeah. The gardens at Bodygathlin had a slow start. When the Mostyn family inherited the house in the Tudor period, they turned the estate over to farming and food production. Like many important houses, it still has its walled kitchen garden. But what makes Bodygathlin different are the terraces and the 200-year-old parterre garden they reveal laid out with their gravel paths and formal symmetrical planting. See, to me, this is fascinating because, you know, there are lots of parterres around the country, but there are very few with herbs, and there's very few that give you this advantage of standing above them, because you can't get into the house. Yeah. You know, so many of them, you've got to go upstairs in the house to see, but here, you've got this lovely walkway yeah. that drifts you through, and you can see it all and enjoy it. Yeah. And it's the millions of years of geology underneath Snowdonia that dictates how gardens like this develop. This is a prehistoric glacial and volcanic landscape, where the glaciers dropped their deposits and where the volcanic ash floated down, decreeing what type of soil you get. And you don't have to be far apart to be working in totally different conditions. What's fascinating about this garden is that we're only five miles away from Bodmin. That's an acid-based garden. Yeah. This is a limestone-based yeah. garden. Yeah. So, you know, what else differs to you as a horticulturalist? Well, we work around the limestone in the plants that we've used, but also it's smaller, it's more compact. Mm. It's got little pockets of gardens, probably more adapted to what was here uh, probably 1900. Mm. If you think of Bodnant, probably 30 gardeners, we've got three. <laughs> Slight difference then? Yes. Yeah. The whole estate here is more than twice the size of Bodnant, yet Robert and his colleagues manage all of this with a tenth of the team. Their job is to preserve as well as to enhance. And that's exactly what Robert's done at the bottom of the garden, a spot visitors rarely reach. Come on, I want to have a nosy down there. From the terrace, everything leads downhill to the vegetable garden and beyond. It might be a hotel these days, but the gardens at Bobby Gathlin Hall still provide the lion's share of produce for its kitchens and flower vases. So I enjoy this bit of the garden. Because, you know, it's all about productivity. And this is all used for cutting, isn't it? Yes, yes. And yeah. presumably you make lovely arrangements up in the house and do yep. all that. Yep. It must have been really great in the old days. You know, the ladies coming down with their baskets, filling them all up and yep. taking them up there. Mm -hmm. And good old day lilies. The best thing to do with a day lily, apart from arranging it, is eating it. Mm. Lovely. Yeah. Just short of a little bit of a dressing. And apart from that, love that. Very good. How do you manage to, you know, do that with your delphiniums? I'd have big stakes in and yeah. I'd have crisscrossing wire. Mm. Well, the florist on Thursday will cut the taller ones out. Right. But because it's in a walled garden, okay. the winds are not going to 
So you don't get eddies? No, no. Well, OK, no. so they just stand there erect yep. and splendid? Yep. Yeah, it'd have to be a really bad oh. day to knock them down. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Do you enjoy the veggie garden? Yes, yes, very much so. Um, the guests love to see homegrown produce going in the house right. they, for the table. And you see, it's so beautiful. But it's, it's the combination of things, isn't it? Because I look at the earth and I see the colour of the soil and yeah. then your eyes taken up to the house and it's yeah. the same colour. The detail, it's the, the lines of the bricks, yeah. then picked up with the lines on the terrace and then you've got the lines of the hedges, the top of the wall and then the lines of the espaliers. Very clever. And the most striking feature is the formal herb parterre. This is an unusual parterre planted with herbs, but here at Body Gathlin, I don't mind that at all. The deep walls protect the parterre from the coastal winds of Colwyn Bay, which means that sun-loving herbs can be grown here most of the year. The tall fronds of the bronze fennel provide architectural height among the herb collection. Bronze fennel is an edible herb, not to be confused with bulb-forming Florence fennel, which is eaten as a vegetable. Bronze fennel is all about the aniseed flavour in its wispy leaves. Then there's the curry plant. This is part of the daisy family and gets its name from the pungent smell of curry drifting up from it, although it's not what it tastes of. If you're going to cook with this herb, use it like you would sage which is also here. It wouldn't be a herb garden without it. This is a Mediterranean herb, but it's put down its roots in many cooler climates and thrives here. On a hot sunny day like this, the walled parterre is thick with scents wafting from every corner. As you descend through the garden rooms at Bobby Gathlin, each one takes you nearer to the tree frame view that brings back warm memories for me. I really enjoy bringing tour groups down here because I bring them through the woods and you're thinking, what's she up to now? And we come along here and all you can see is a green terrace. They don't understand it. And I come along here and I say, now, why don't you just take a look at that? And all is revealed. Colway Castle. And we used to come to Rome. My dad, every year, used to take me to see the smallest house. And then my mum would buy crab off that guile on the front, and we'd have crab butties, and then we'd have a look at Conway Castle, and then we'd wander off up into Snowdonia, and that was our holiday for year after year as little kids. And that's why I love coming back here, and that's why I love that view. So many reasons to visit a garden, some of them plants, some of them memories. A garden is an age memoir to life. I've only got to close my eyes for my personal garden memories to appear. And at Bodnant, which according to one visitor, is heaven on earth. I'd like to leave a tribute to all the people who make these memories happen every day. Replacing one of the weathered rose trellis urns would leave a fresh mark in this piece of heaven. Designer of all things exquisite and wooden, Andrew John Lloyd has taken up the challenge. Well, creating this urn has been quite a difficult project. There have no detailed drawings of this piece available. So we're having to literally go back to the drawing board and recreate what the original draftsman created. At this stage, things are worked out mathematically to create the jigs that we're going to have to make to process the making of this urn. We are using traditional methods to create what is a traditional urn. So they had to go right back to basics. And although they're using modern power tools, the techniques and processes are the same as they were when Lord Aberconway commissioned all those rolls urns half a century ago. Well, the materials we're using on this urn are native to Bodmin Gardens itself. We're using Douglas fir for the cap, which has a great durability to weathers. And then for the main body, we're using oak, which has a great strength and will give the structure its stability.
It's not only as 14 peaks and is rich in wildlife, but the mountains over there provide the source of raw materials for the people that live and work there. Sheep farming and slate mining have been the mainstays of Snowdonia's economy for centuries. Generation after generation of men would go to work in the mines, eking out a meagre living. But when the need for slate went into decline, the quarries and mines stopped working, and so did the men. The area suffered a lot of unemployment over the past 60 years. But community initiatives to help retrain locals are getting people back into work, as well as helping those that have wandered away from the straight and narrow. One such organisation is a garden project run by Tina Hill. The project is one of the many projects that are run by a group called Gillig for Gwydia, which is a local social enterprise community group. So this is our gardening project. We have um, a very formal uh, vegetable garden, and we have potential for a, a much less formal, but equally important, forest garden. Tina trains the volunteers in the techniques needed to run the gardens here, teaching them everything from basic soil preparation to planting and harvesting. The programme aims to give them the skills to find alternative employment. We give them opportunities, we show them what's possible, and we'll support them in their choices. Anthony Sinkinson, a seasonal kitchen worker in the local hotels, had been unemployed for a while. With nothing to do all day, he got himself into a little bit of local bother. But joining Galig for Gwydia has turned his life round. I started volunteering about five or six months ago. I was hanging about with the wrong crowd and you know, I was doing silly things sometimes and I just wanted to get away from all that and do something for the community, for myself and for my daughter and for all of us who are involved in the garden. It's a scenario that Tina has seen before. Being a rural area, there's not that much in the way of work. People want to stay here, they've got a support network here and it's important for them, particularly if you're in, in that situation where you're looking for work. You get, it's very easy to get depressed, it's very easy to get isolated and you need your network of people around you. Without much large industry left in the area, employment is seasonal, based around the ebb and flow of visitors to the area. We kind of rely on tourists and things like that, you know, because we are in the middle of nowhere, really, and you know, it's not like a city, you know, where there are loads of people all the time. And um, it's pretty much in the, in the summer, really, where jobs become available. But then, you know, during the winter, it goes quiet again especially within the cooking industry, like, you know, working in hotels and things around here, like. Anthony's knowledge of fresh vegetables, learned during his work as a seasonal chef, has paid dividends when it comes to working at the project's kitchen garden. When we came here, the place was, oh, it was pretty wild. You know, everything was overgrown and nobody had been here for a good year. We've just re-dug up all the beds. Um, we've come in and put new paths down. We've. Um, redone the beds, put new wood and that down. Um, we've got our own compost bins up and running. We've got the polytunnel up and going. We've got tomatoes, peppers, rhubarb, pumpkins. We've got all sorts going there, yeah. This place is all about collaboration, team building and changing life for the better. That's my kind of gardening. Since doing this volunteering and that, I've. I just love it, being outside, being in the garden, um, learning about the plants and you know how they work together and what they do for the environment. And you know, I've decided now that I want a change of career and you know get a job working in gardens or up in the woods. It's definitely been a major change in my life doing something like this. Um, it's helped me get away from town and come to somewhere like here and kind of get me away from people that I was hanging about with and things. I've been here a couple of times with my daughter and my mates brought his daughter and you know we all get stuck in and just to see the work that we've done now and everything growing nice like is just brilliant yeah and I can't wait for it to grow even more to be honest and start picking what we've grown like and hopefully you know sort out the community a bit help the community and help ourselves. Henry Poaching and the Abbey Conways were the wealthy landlords in North Wales, employing large numbers of labourers on the estate. But a century on, and its smaller parcels of land like Gallig for Gwydia that are providing a way into work.
Here at Bodnan, they now employ one of the project's former volunteers, who learn skills that they can now develop further in this grand garden. Fiona started out with a small patch of land during her apprenticeship here and has worked her way up to become central to the gardening team. Gardens are hard work. It's no walk in the park maintaining 80 acres to this standard. Just look at this rose garden. It's Phyllis's favourite part of Bodnan and the perfect spot to celebrate the volunteers' commitment. For me, this garden's about magic because whenever I come here, I wander along the terraces and I have to be honest, I tend to rush through there because it's the magic in the dell that turns me on. But do you know what also turns me on? And that's your passion. Now, Andy and Andy's team has made this amazing urn. And you said to me something earlier that stuck a real chord. And it was about a visitor. And what does this sound do you watch? Never a there. Which is? Heaven on earth. You and the volunteers, every single one of you, make this garden. What do you think? I think it's absolutely beautiful. I think it's grand, isn't it? I think up it can go. I'll go. Up. Well, now it's up there, I think it looks even better than when it was down here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think it's really absolutely beautiful. Yeah. So I think it's a toss for Bodman. Cheers. <laughs> Bodman. 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 Yeah. 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 Hewn from the hillside, wrestled to the ground and planted so beautifully. Bodnant and Bobby Gathlin of Victorian jewels in Snowdonia's crown. I've visited them both so often, I've lost count. And even now, and every time you come back to this garden, it's romantic, it's elegant, and there's always something new. Because people think they come to a garden once, and that's it. But it isn't. Every time I come, I know I'm going to leave feeling really happy and totally in love with the place.